um, so that, hey, yay, there we are. Hello, you are with um, the Vermont Climate Solutions Caucus at our every other Thursday meeting. Um, so welcome and thanks for being with us today. Um, wanted to first draw your attention to our um, our wonderful Friday morning blog with uh, with Becca White from last week, which was great fun. <laughs> uh, Bob Farnham, Bob the Green Guy, did a great job of um, of uh, helping us put that video together, and and Becca gives us a recap on the Transportation Modernization Act. So uh, do hop over and take a look at that. Um, so Chris, how have you been? Uh, good, you know, zoomed out like everybody, but but holding in there. I'm glad, grateful for this group because uh, we have a lot of work and, and the focus uh, keeps me motivated. So yeah. nice to see everybody. Absolutely. Uh, such important work that we have before us as a Climate Solutions Caucus. And, and we're gonna get to a, a conversation about how we uh, how we look for opportunities in every committee. Uh, but we wanted to wait a few more minutes to start that until uh, more people filter over from, uh, from their uh, morning committee meetings to jump into the, to the climate caucus meeting. So while we're waiting on that, I just wanted to, to ask if anyone has um, uh, a climate bill that they are looking to put in in these last days of bill introduction. And um, I know that some of you are looking for co-sponsors. Um, and so Gabrielle, go right ahead. Thank you, Chair. Um, and thanks everyone to uh, those of you who have already signed on. I did just forward uh, to both, uh, both <laughs> Proposed bills uh, to your inboxes, so uh, you can pull them up as I discuss them. Um, the short form bill um, proposes to direct the JFO and the Secretary of Administration to annually, by September 1st of each year, conduct an economic analysis and forecast over a 50 year time period to assess the long term economic and fiscal impacts, as well as the human and public policy challenges of climate change. And this came from when I was executive director of Renewable Energy Vermont um, for just under five years, um, about five years ago. Uh, and I would frequently go in to testify and the answer often was, this is too costly right now. And um, so in December of this past year, when Joint Fiscal gave an overview of the revenue forecast to incoming lawmakers, I asked uh, Tom Covet, um, who supports the JFO, um, you know, are, are these forecasts including, um, you know, what we're gonna pay for if we don't pay now uh, with regards to climate change so we can really have an apples to apples comparison. And he said, no, they don't. Um, they only go out five years and uh, it'd be a really good idea to do that. Um, so after a number of email exchanges with Mr. Covet, um, this short form bill uh, kicks off hopefully a discussion um, with the committees of jurisdiction. And I do plan on submitting this later today. So I would love if you're willing to co-sign um, for you to just send me an email saying yes. Happy to take questions or otherwise I can skip over to the other bill. Let's let's jump to that if you don't Great. mind. Yep, uh, to the longer bill. So uh, one of my campaign issues was the fact that um, I again witnessed you know an annual budget experience um, that doesn't necessarily have a long term plan um, for Vermont in terms of how we grow uh, and how we do it in a way that grows our economy as well as our people, um, but also is aligned with climate goals. Um, and environmental sustainability. Um, and so Representative Sims, Representative Bloomley, and I have developed uh, the longer bill. What this would do is it creates a study committee to make a recommendation for reviving and modernizing the state planning office to oversee and coordinate at every level of government the following areas. First, the prioritization of where we should be investing into Vermont's economy and people aligned with climate goals and environmental sustainability. Second, community engagement, equity, and language access in government operations. Third, long-term emergency and disaster preparedness and recovery. Fourth, standardized data collection and management. And fifth, Intergo intergovernmental communications and coordination. Um, and in your emails, uh, you will find um, a link to the list um, that you can sign on 
Uh, it's a little different. It's not a yes to me. It's um, a list that you sign on. I'm happy to answer any questions, but I know there's a lot to cover. Thank you. Thanks, Gabrielle. <clears throat> um, so I'll, let's do just a couple of quick questions. And then um, if anyone else has bills that they're looking for co-sponsors on, we wanna do a quick run through of those. Um, so Sarita. Yep, just a clarification question, Gabrielle. I'm on the uh, Colchester Planning Board and I've always wanted a state, we have regional, but we don't have a state planning office. Now, is that what you're talking about or I, or is it something different? Uh, well, that's what this working group is supposed to look at. And um, yes, it would be, I mean, one of the questions is, is this housed within the governor's um, administration or is this a separate body? Um, and yes, it's really supposed to look at um, not just land use planning, um, but also, you know, how are we going to grow our economy? How are we going to be equitable? Um, and how do we, you know, what's our plan? So I, I would also prefer a name that's more like the Office of Prioritization and Coordination. But yes, it would be statewide. Okay, thank you. Uh, Senator Perchlick, you had your hand up. I was to talk about my bill. I didn't okay, know. go ahead. Uh, I'm going to be putting in a bill looking for Senate co-sponsors. So, Chris, you're it. Um, no, no pressure. <laughs> that is, it requires BGS to install only renewable heating systems starting like fiscal year 23 or 4. Basically, if we're going to meet our 90% goal by 2050, we can't put in heating systems. These big boilers last 20, 30, 40 years. So we have to stop putting them in. So it just says that they have to only put in renewable heating systems, which they're already doing sort of now with uh, advanced wood heating systems and some ground source and air source heat pumps, but this just requires it. Great. Great. Excellent. Um, so uh, let's hold on to any other um, calls for co-sponsorship until the end of the meeting, because we want to make sure that we spend some time talking about um, our, our, work in each different policy committee. And uh, our hope was that we would use this meeting to, um, to hear what different committees in the House and the Senate are doing um, uh, that, that relates to climate and how we can integrate uh, climate into our focus. I mean, Senator Perschlick's idea is a, is a great one that comes to mind. Um, there, there are any number of ways that we need to be focused on climate if we're going to meet our uh, our long-term goals, and many of those uh, changes need to come about now. So, um, Chris, do you want to you want to lead the the way on this discussion, and I will um, I will help support that. Sure, I'll do my best. And and just so context, you recall a year ago we had banner bills, and then we had every committee bills, and they weren't necessarily bills. But the idea is, of course, there's not really a silo in the building that shouldn't be focused with an eye on, on the climate crisis. Um, and so we wanna make sure that we're communicating with one another about opportunities we see in different committees that aren't necessarily the natural resources or the energy technology committees on our side, uh, those are kind of together, but, um, and, and stay focused. So. What we'd like to do is kind of hear from you all um, and, and just go through the roster of committees, hear from you ideas that are coming forward, opportunities you see, and then we'll look at the list that uh, we generated uh, a year and a half ago that came out of the working group and the summer process that many, many of you were involved in. So, um, Sarah, do you, you said you had the, the roster right in front of you of, of House committees. Um, just, just take it from the top, I think, and, and we'll see who, we don't have our full contingent here, but uh, we've got a decent beginning of our group. So yeah, it let's... doesn't look like we have anybody from House Ag and Forest Products. Um, so do you want to talk um, Ag on the Senate side? Sure, happy to. I'm the Vice Chair of Ag. Uh, we've got a couple of things working just to keep people informed. We're doing a compost bill that um, is attempting to allow farms to diversify and accept a small amount of compost without going through an A&R process, which farmers are sort of reticent to do. 
Uh, we are, as we know, not putting food scraps or not supposed to be putting scraps in the landfill. We are in fact trucking a lot of our food scraps to Maine to be incinerated. That's absurd. At the same time, we need those food scraps to help our ag economy build soil and build soil health. Uh, then there's also a select number of farmers that feed food scraps to chickens in a, in a very holistic process. So we're trying to make that easier for them. Um, and that uh, has, a, has a good climate impact actually. And I believe we're gonna vote that out this week. We're also working on- um, a Chris, bill sorry, do you have a number for that? No, because it's a committee bill. Uh, we've oh, had a committee bill, okay. We should have a number, if not tomorrow, then early next week, I'll be glad to update people. We're all doing a local fa a farm to school bill incentives. We're trying to do incentives for schools to buy local, pro f local products. New York and other states have done this. And basically you, you beef up um, the money we pay for school lunches is based on uh, if they hit up 20% or 30% of their food is local. Uh, I think it goes without saying that's obvious, uh, has a climate impact and uh, stronger local foods impact. So, so there's a couple things going on in ag. Excellent. Thank you. I'm going to skip over appropriations for now because I don't think we have anyone who's on appropriations here. Um, so from the commerce and economic development perspective, um, I don't see someone uh, on that committee here at the moment, but I know that um, representatives White and Nigro are both um, frequent attendees for, of the Climate Solutions Caucus and they sit on House Commerce and Economic Development. So let's, um, let's list them and check in with them um, as soon as we can. Uh, that brings us to corrections and institutions. And I'm not seeing anybody on CNI either. Um, either of those, uh, uh, Senator Perchlick or Pearson, either of those committees on your side um, uh, working Dick, on anything? Not that I know of. Our, our, our institutions committee is, is uh, not the uh, innovative group you might hope. So um, we'll see what we can figure out. Senator McCormick, Dick McCormick is been somewhat participating with us is on there. I'll ask him and check in. Great. Um, that brings us to the education committee. Um, and, uh, and we've got some folks from education. So um, Kath, I know that you guys are, are going to be focusing on, um, on some aspects of our school building infrastructure um, with a, a hopeful eye to being able to use uh, some federal money to help us assess the state of our buildings. Um, can you help us understand any climate focus in that project and or um, other climate focus that you might be covering in education? I can, and Sarita can chime in if I, if I miss anything, but we have a committee bill that um, I think we're gonna be voting out soon. And it's a pretty comprehensive school construction bill that starts with updating the facility standards, um, doing a, sa a statewide assessment to get a handle on the condition of school buildings, and then um, also simultaneously do a funding study on how we would um, help pay for these projects um, in some way or help fund them. And um, it includes an emphasis on building efficiency, both water and energy efficiency. So um, that's mentioned several times in the bill and um, I think would be included in all of this work. And I don't think, Sarita, I'm, I'm not thinking of any other work we're doing that's touching on climate right now, are you? No, that, that I, I was just gonna add, you know, say the, uh, the efficiency part of that bill, that that will be assessed, which I think will be really important and really helpful. Perch, like anything we should know about in the Senate, Ed? Um, other than uh, some of the food and school bills that will come from your ag committee, we hope to take up. And we might take a different tact of the school facilities bill, you know, trying to specifically focus on the air quality, like a step two from what we did last year, but also in support of what the House is doing on that. Great. Excellent. 
Um, Energy and Technology, which is its own committee on the House side, but folded into other committees on the Senate side. Um, energy folks. I, I can talk. I know Mike Antochka is uh, is in the, in the meeting too. I saw his, his face. So you can, um, uh, our committee has been <clears throat> spending um, most of our time uh, uh, up until now, uh, putting out, uh, getting ready to put out a very comprehensive uh, committee bill on broadband. So that has taken up most of our energy. I think people know that there actually is a fair amount of intersection between broadband and uh, energy and climate change. I won't, I won't go into all of that, but this is going to be a, a pretty uh, comprehensive and ambitious um, uh, bill on, on broadband. Uh, we have been um, following um, and, and, may, and are getting ready to make comments uh, to the Appropriations Committee on some things in the uh, governor's uh, proposed uh, budget uh, and dealing with climate change, or notably a proposal for um, uh, community solar, which is a different model for um, people who might not otherwise be able to do their own uh, solar for either economic reasons or location reasons to basically buy in uh, to uh, a, a community project and uh, to, if needed, to have help with that with that buy in. And 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 Mike has been tracking that a little bit uh, more more than I have. And I'm following uh, weatherization. You may know that the governor is proposing to use. Uh, um, uh, $25 million of one-time funds uh, for weatherization in three pots. Um, uh, one is for municipal buildings, one is for the existing uh, low-income weatherization program, and the largest one is for, uh, for um, a, a variety of uh, financing options um, uh, to help people at somewhat higher income levels, financing and perhaps grant uh, options and that money, as proposed, goes to the Vermont Housing Finance Agency, and we are looking into that and getting ready to let the, our appropriations committee know what that means. Uh, down the road, uh, I, I know that in the Senate there's a lot of work being done on weatherization, um, and I expect if the Senate passes something that will uh, uh, land in our our committee. And we have a few other at this point. Um, I'm going to say smaller bills. Um, uh, one which uh, I introduced, which was introduced last year, but, uh, but didn't make it uh, over the summer, uh, which is to authorize the extension of operation of the Rygate uh, wood chip generating plant, um, uh, which is what's called a standard offer project. Uh, the output of that goes uh, uh, pro rata to all utilities and to all of their customers in the state of Vermont. And there are a few other um, uh, smaller bills at, at this point in, in our committee that we will get to uh, once we get the broadband bill out the door. Mike, anything to add? Yeah, um, just to uh, expand a little bit on the uh, uh, community solar project um, program. Uh, the governor is recommending $10 million go into um, uh, this program that would uh, create about five megawatts of electricity from solar projects. And um, <clears throat> this program would assist low and moderate income Vermonters up to 150% of median family, family income uh, to buy into these projects and then uh, get a credit on their uh, electric bills uh, for the energy that's produced. And uh, this would, this would be unlike net metering where you have to be in the territory where the project is in order to <clears throat> buy into it. You could be anywhere in the state and the project could be anywhere in the state and you could buy into that project and, uh, and get the credits from that solar energy. So this would make it, as Aram said, available for renters and for um, people who don't have the capacity to put solar on their roof or in their backyards or someplace so uh, it's and and it's uh, not being a net metering project the 
uh, there, there'll be a reverse auction type of a scenario in, in terms of the uh, developers uh, um, participating in this. And uh, that would reduce the price of electricity that's, that's being paid similar to the standard offer. Excellent. Pearson or Perchlick, anything to add on the Senate side? Just one point that I've heard on the governor's community solar project is potential other uses. If, if our goal is to reduce carbon emissions, whether solar is the, is the best community solar is the best way to spend that $10 million. I, just some discussions happening. I, I'm glad the governor proposed it and I think it's a good project, but I think it's worth thinking about whether it's the best idea. Yeah, the other thing I might mention is that $10 million goes into the uh, Clean Energy Development Fund, which Senator Perchlick is uh, very familiar with. Great. All right, General Housing and Military Affairs. We have with us the vice chair of that committee. Um, that committee is, the, uh, is in possession of one of our um, areas of focus this year, which is contractor registry. Um, this is a, a, a very light touch of regulation, um, basically just a, a straight registration, but would give us the opportunity to be able to disseminate information out to folks who are helping Vermonters um, with building and remodeling um, and uh, being able to get all of that uh, up to date uh, efficiency information and renewable energy information out to those contractors is uh, important to us. So Chip, any updates on that or other things you might be doing with a climate focus? Uh, well, uh, we have been talking about bringing the contractor's bill out. It also um, could be part of another bill that we might take up um, instead of that, which would contain many of the uh, sections that um, uh, the contractor's bill uh, does um, uh, have in it. Um, you know, last year when we took testimony, not only would it have an um, educational component for contractors to be up and aware of, of your, our energy standards um, required at this point by law um, in, bill, in, in new buildings, um, it also has a component of consumer protection. Uh, we heard from a disabled uh, uh, man that um, was uh, taken off for about $5,000 or so for, by a, a, a scrupulous con uh, a contractor. While we do have criminal statutes that uh, can do that, uh, can accommodate that, um, they are rarely used. So um, we thought that uh, in the, uh, as OPR maintains a list of these uh, registered contractors, um, uh, complaints filed against them could be uh, part of uh, what they, uh, of the information that they store uh, and could help consumers um, uh, uh, stay away from uh, unscrupulous contractors. So um, one way or another, we will get that bill out. Um, there's, uh, we're, we're in the midst of a lot of labor uh, issues right now. Um, and those are not uh, to be heard around <laughs> in this caucus. Uh, but, um, you know, I think I am, I'm suggesting that we move forward on the contract uh, on the contractor's bill and Tom and I have had a number of conversations about it so I think we're going to get it out thank you Gabrielle question on that just a comment if that's okay um, my day job uh, I was the project manager for um, leading the energy experts who wrote the most recent Vermont building energy code and I can't tell you how many meetings I went to all over the state where contractors would show up and say I didn't even know we had code and we've had code in this state for for over you know over 10 15 years um, so this is really important not only for climate reasons but also for the workers um, so that they uh, we make sure that they actually you know are provided the support they need um, particularly as we've seen with COVID, and then also um, to the previous representative's comments, uh, the fact that it's it's important for consumer protection as well. Thanks. Absolutely. Mar Mari? My, uh, one of the, the women that's working with me as an intern um, did a project on GIS mapping um, involving housing. So um, I'll just throw that out there. I don't want to offer her services without asking her first, but um, I can talk with her about whether she'd be interested in talking about that project. Excellent. 
Pearson and Perch look anything on the Senate side in this realm? No. All right, that takes us to healthcare and we do have a couple folks from the healthcare committee with us, um, Brian. So um, yesterday we were doing, um, we were talking about the one-time money um, that, that might be spent. And in that discussion, um, we're talking about health, housing is healthcare and investments in rehabilitating um, group homes and facilities. And in that discussion, we were creating a list of criteria. And I suggested that we look at um, investments in efficiency as a criteria. So Mari and I and Leslie will have a chance and others who may be on healthcare will have a chance to review those criteria this week. And so I'm hoping we can advocate that there's a strong, some kind of strong direction in that. So that's one piece. And then we're making investments in telemedicine. Um, and so that's also, there's a climate implications of that. So those are two things I could think of. I'm not going to try to say everything because we have two other people here, but those are just two things I'll throw out there and then step back. Thanks, Brian. Mar, you got, you got some ideas Brian, to add? Brian covered it. It was, um, about, uh, telehealth and, um, including audio only, which <laughs> impacts... <laughs> A lot of our, our rural folks um, needing, um, not being able to drive or um, don't have broadband to do telemedicine at home. So um, audio only is part of the telehealth. And thank you, Kippo and Willow, for your thoughts. <laughs> All right. Um, Pearson or Perchlick, anything in healthcare or human services related, which is what we'll go to next on the house side. Uh, well, neither of us are on those committees, uh, but we can, we definitely have allies on there, on there, so we can check in. Uh, Great. Yeah. Uh, do we have anyone in the human services committee? Nope, I don't see anyone from human services. So um, that takes us to the judiciary committee. Anyone have climate focused um initiatives in the judiciary. You know, every time I make every time I make the pitch that every committee has to be involved in the climate crisis, I always trip myself up because I've never tried quite figured out how judiciary could do it. But anyone who can who can answer that riddle for me, uh, I'll send you a chocolate bar. <laughs> well, it might be something as um, oh, mundane. Oh, challenge as it, accepted. Yes. Kornheiser. Do toxic spills spend a lot of time in judiciary? Toxics, sure. Okay, that's liability. fair. All the li all the worlds of liability related to irresponsibility yeah. or lack of responsibility regarding climate. Um, right. Any housing in flood zones that was known to be a flood zone when it was placed there. You can do a lot in judiciary. Okay, okay. Not that I have any bills on that. Winner, winner. All right, so how I have about- another idea. Do I also get a chocolate bar? Yes, sure, Carol. <laughs> <laughs> uh oh, I think it left my mind because I was so excited. <laughs> yeah, I was too excited. I'll, I'll, I'll let you know. Uh, all right. Well, we do have, of course, Selena Coburn is, is on judiciary and, and Barbara Richardson, Martin Law, people who have been active. So yeah. we, we're, we can get an update from them down the road. Uh, next up is natural resources, fish and wildlife. So uh, we do have... Um, uh, Larry Satkowitz with us, um, and maybe Larry can share with us uh, some climate focus on the house side. Yeah, I'd really be happy to. Um, so I guess the two two big things are, one is the bottle bill, and we've been taking extensive testimony um, with regards to that. Um, this bill would, um, you know, would, would expand the types of containers that are that come under the bottle bill. Um, right now, we only have like maybe half of all containers that are used in Vermont um, go through redemption centers and other places that take deposits and um, all the rest um, hopefully get into the recycle bins. Um, and um, so that's, that's the, 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 big, the big part of that. Um, and we would be increased, and this bill would also increase the deposit from five to 10 cents to further encourage people to go through the um, Redemption Center route um, and pick stuff up off the you know the byways. Um, so that's one bill that we've really been spending a lot of time on. And then the other one, which we've which is not a bill yet, but um, perhaps it will be soon, um, is talking about um, 
the you know the current use or um, that you know that big forest um, project, um, parcels can be um, in and one thing which Vermont um, doesn't do but a bunch of other states do do is um, allow unmanaged land um, to be a part of those kinds of programs mm -hmm. and right now if you have a big um, forested parcel and you want to keep it just wild you're not eligible for current use and we're looking to change that to encourage more wild lands because we're talking and this is specifically you know getting into climate change um, one of the cheapest ways that we can sequester carbon is by just allowing forests to grow and um, this would be a, a measure that would um, encourage that. Great thanks Larry. Um, Mari you have a question or something to add on that? Just um, to add on to that in, including I'm really excited about the opportunity um, for wilding in uh, or rewilding in current use. Um, a bill that I introduced that's in House Natural Resources um, adds a protection or clarifies in Vermont water quality standards uh, protection um, for wetlands. Um, and one of the results of um, clarifying that is that um, interstate projects like pipelines um, would have a much higher bar to meet before uh, being able to put a pipeline through through wetlands. Um, New York State and I think a few other states have similar legislation. Um, and then Larry, I'm just wondering if you have an update on where that's where that's at now. I know a, a fair amount of testimony has been taken. Yeah, sure. Um, that's a good point. Um, that the pipelines would be a big issue too. Um, right now, it looks like we're heading towards um, um, having, um, I guess it's H108 um, would, would be, how do I say this? Um, the original language in H108 spelled out in a lot of detail, like some of the things which you might normally expect as being rules that the Agency of National Resources would create. And we got some pushback on that, but the agency has agreed that they would create the rules. So it looks like what we're going to probably end up with is a bill that will um, sort of spell out, you know, what the rules ought to look like in sort of more broad stroke um, and give the agency a deadline for coming up with them. And we've been hearing some testimony from the agency in more detail already about what those rules would look like. And so it feels like there's some good progress on that and that we'll be able to have um, pretty much, you know, what we want and also address a lot of the concerns that ANR has had. Thanks, Larry. Um, we do have a couple more committees to get through and, and we've promised to try to make these meetings under an hour. So Mike, if you would just hold your question for a moment, um, I would love for us to say uh, to the senators, do you have any updates on natural resources related priorities on the Senate side? I mean, no. No. no? no. Okay. Uh, transportation realm. Um, we uh, we have talked some about the Transportation Modernization Act on the House side. Um, a quick overview of how that's coming, um, and then we'll flip over. We have uh, Senator Chittenden, who has uh, just joined us. Um, he's on the. Transportation Committee on the Senate side, along with Senator Perchlick. So, um, Becca, do you want to do, do a quick update, and then we'll pop to the Senate side? Sure. Yeah, you heard a bit about it earlier, um, and we luck out. We've got Representative Burke and Representative Stevens, uh, and you know Representative Cormick. So, there's a lot of folks on the Climate Caucus. Uh, we're mainly thinking about H94 as our uh, climate piece and we're currently trying to incorporate that into the T-bill as it's being drafted. Uh, lots of interesting pieces coming out, uh, fair free, more incentives for electric vehicles, ideally electric bikes being added to that, Representative Burke's uh, highlight, uh, and then replace your ride, mileage smart, lots of good programs to make uh, transportation more equitable and accessible um, and more carbon being reduced. I, I just want to add to that, that we're sort of doing a little dance with the uh, proposal from the agency and H94, comparing them, 
talking about them, getting testimony, no decisions made. I think our chair is teeing, up, teeing it up very well for um, consideration. So we just don't know where all the chips are gonna fall, but uh, it's been a pretty, pretty positive um, conversation. I think it's gonna come down to how much money will be spent on the various incentive programs and whether we can get money in for the mobility and innovation, mobility and transportation innovation grant program, which has been really the pilot project that's happening in Montpelier now around transit, sort of an Uber style transit. So uh, to be determined and maybe um, Gabrielle has something else to add. Good, in the interest of time, I've spoken. <laughs> All right, Senators Perchlick and Chittenden. Let me just tee it up for Thomas, who's just joined us. We're going through every committee to, to pull out uh, climate priorities that are being worked on uh, in, in maybe smaller sections of bills, et cetera. I know that Senate Transportation always waits for the House to go first, So, um, but either of you have highlights that we should know about? I want to completely yield to our Vice Chair, Senator Perchlick. So Senator Perchlick. Thank you, Senator Chendon. Um, yeah, I'm interested in seeing the House bill, hopefully that, you know, S or how H-94 just gets incorporated in the T-bill. When you send the T-bill, all that other stuff is in there. I think that would be a great package for the Senate to work on. I think one, you know, we have a lot of the similar interests on those things, but two things that I don't think are in there that we're working on. One is to allow electric vehicle manufacturers that sell directly to consumers to open a service center in the state. There's a house companion bill, 115, I think there's something like that. So that, it seems like a small thing, but it's, it's been difficult to get it passed. And I think it's really important if we are going to continue to electrify our, our vehicles to, to say that we're open to these direct to consumer manufacturers. If not, they're just going to build these service centers over the border in New Hampshire or something. So it's, it would be a really loss without any gain if we, if we don't do it, in my, my view. But we've had good testimony on it so far. Um, also, we're going to be looking at, I don't know if you guys have done this in the House, and this is how to pay, how the electric vehicles are going to pay into the transportation fund, which is a big issue for members of the Senate Transportation Committee. I think even though it's not like a key thing that we need to do when you're just thinking about how we get more electric vehicles, but we do need to do it if we're going to get more electric vehicles because there, there are certain members that aren't going to be supportive of more incentives to electric vehicles until we kind of figure out this out. And AOT is looking at it. And so we're interested in digging into that, whether it starts next year or down the line, we need to figure that out. So we're going to be digging into that issue this year. Senator Perch, like I hope there is a, a really clear conversation happening in your committee around the study that was done by the agency that tells us exactly when we need to put in place those, those fees. And that's when we reach that 15% mark. I'm sure you're making that point, but for any member who's listening, we have information about when we should actually start charging a fee. And it's as recommended at the 15% saturation rate. And we're at 1% for electric vehicles. So we've got an unfortunately long way to go. Yeah, and there's it, basically what we're saying is that it's good to figure it out now. Let's not wait till we get to 15% and then figure it out because we want to give everybody confidence that we have it figured out and that there's agreement on how we're going to do it and when it's going to be implemented. And we're over 1% if you look at vehicles sold, but if you look at just total vehicles, it is like 1%. So depends on... <laughs> what the uh, equation is, but I think that, that covers it. Great, thank you. Uh, George? Yeah, thank, thank you. Um, I was just wanting to say, tell the Senator, you know, on the House side, I put in that same bill and we got 15 co-sponsors in I think one evening um, from all sides of the aisle. So um, there's enthusiasm for that in the House too, but I don't think the Transportation Committee is doing anything with it. I think they're waiting for you all to uh, to finish with it. Great, thank you for putting it in. I, that, that helps to know that it's there and to let folks know. So. Thank you. Um, so that brings us to Ways and Means slash Senate Finance. And I think the House Ways and Means Committee might win the day in terms of the greatest number of committee members, including their vice chair, uh, who are here at the uh, Climate Caucus meeting. So. Um, 
who wants to jump in and uh, tell us what climate focus you are working on in Ways and Means? I think we deserve well, at least I deserve double chocolate, and I think everyone else in Ways and Means deserves single chocolate from co for coming to this meeting because we have now won twice. Bribery is that what it's going to take? Bribery? It's really, there's very little to help with the days lately, and so yes. It used to be pizza, now it's chocolate. <laughs> um, I think we did. We have had. We've touched on the conversation around transportation um, and road fees and solar and all of that um, a little bit, and yeah. Um, yeah, this may be kind of um, <clears throat> around the diamond and finally back to home plate. We spent some time this morning with Steve Klein talking about federal money that's um, currently en route, I guess you could say, to Vermont. Last sp spring, summer, you all remember we had a struggle trying to figure out how to use the money given federal rules here, there, and everywhere. Um, but it turns out there's a significant amount of money that may be useful not for climate specifically um, but for education and uh, school construction and maybe the pension fund and things like that um, which may mean down the road that there will be money available for other things that are near and dear to this working group's heart so we would hope um, and as i said not specific to this committee um, caucus group quite yet, but you know, who knows? We can always hope and and, um, and I see Chris nodding his head. We'll certainly hope that we can get things moving in the right direction. Thanks. Excellent. Carol, and then we'll go over to the Senate side. Well, there was a comment made today when after we heard what Jim was just talking about, the money coming into the state for education, that we could uh, possibly use some of it to um, for a school construction inventory assessment. And on that, we could be very uh, cognizant of um, climate and Absolutely. correct insulation and energy and everything. Excellent. So um, let's finish off with a, a, a quick um, review of Senate finance. And then um, Chris, maybe you can also give folks a, a, an assignment for what to be thinking about over the coming weeks as we near crossover. Sure. So uh, the ranking member of finance is not the, the exciting uh, vice chair position, but we've been working on Rygate. Uh, Avram mentioned this. This is a sticky one um, that we're trying to figure out what is the right thing to do, uh, sort of competing interests between a healthy forest industry and and cleaner power. Um, I also have a bill. It hasn't surfaced yet because the Senate doesn't have a deadline the way you do, um, but to um, make sure that storage for battery power on the grid is treated from tax ways, uh, just like a solar panel is, uh, which is very important to the industry. And as we're, we're seeing more and more storage come online, we got to get clear on that. So I'm hoping that we'll be able, we'll be able to advance that. Um, I'm sure there are other issues that I'm forgetting, but those are the, the quick first two off the top of my head. Um, and uh, yeah, Emily. Um, can I just add one more issue that we're picking up? Um, so we're talking about expanding um, exemptions for manufacturing inputs. And one of those manufacturing inputs is sort of is energy production for whatever's happening in the factory. And so there are sort of um, some opportunities there in both directions, both negative and positive towards climate change implications. And we're sort of talking about that. Mm -hmm. What can be incentivized and what shouldn't be incentivized. Great, thanks for keeping an eye on that. So um, this has been great. I appreciate everybody's input and and I, I hope we'll do this again. And now that we've had the first go around, if people can be sitting in committee when you're not on the edge of your seat, maybe you can be thinking about <clears throat> ways that um, we can incorporate climate work into other bills that are moving, little, little changes, uh, whether it's the physical infrastructure of the state or policy or tax policy, et cetera. I think it's really, really important. My, my hope would be <clears throat> when we come back, um, we won't meet until for Crowder and um, after our break. So we get a little bit of a break. I hope we'll be thinking about bills that are moving, maybe do an update um, 
and look for opportunities where we could potentially offer amendments um, and, and try to make bills stronger or bills that have missed opportunities that we see, uh, try to bring them up as they go into the money committees or what have you. Um, I, I really hope we can get organized. It's so challenging over Zoom and in the middle of a pandemic, but um, there's still incredible work to be done, obviously. And, and uh, if we don't do it, it's not clear who will do it uh, for the legislature. So um, keep those thinking caps on and, and uh, you know, reach out by the email list or to me and Sarah directly if you want help with ideas or, or and like that. Um, Sarah, what did I miss? That sounds excellent. Um, thank you for, for framing up what we're going to do um, post town meeting recess. Um, Mari's got her hand up. Hmm. Yeah, I was just going to suggest if uh, people are going to communicate uh, every committee bills to you, Chris and Sarah, um, maybe it would be helpful for those of us that are managing comms um, to be copied on it so we can update the, the every committee list. Um, so that would be uh, Kath, me and um, Selena. Yeah, and, and folks can send it to me and Sarah, we can also copy our team uh, at our, uh, we check in once a week at least, so. Okay. Um, Thanks uh, for I the great work. Yeah, thank you everybody. And um, this is uh, a small but productive crew. I'm gonna take us offline unless there's anything else, Sarah. That's all I got. <laughs>